this isn't what we're here for. We're here to be um, equipped to go out into the, you know, to our neighbors and our friends all the way around. So fear sometimes stops us from doing that. And we need faith, not fear. So I, you know, I saw the thing about raising my faith to go out and talk to our neighbors. You know, we had people round over Christmas. We had our neighbors round. Very small thing to do, but it was just such a... Afterwards, it went, oh, look what we've done. It was sort of like, we need to do more. Then there's the sort of being still. And as John did the first thing, your know, strength does arise when we are still before God. It gives us time to think about things. But being still and wait on God and listen to his voice but always preparing ourselves in the waiting, trusting God, trusting his timing, not our timing, on what we want in life or what we, our desires are. Um, and today, to finish it with, I'm going to talk about looking at Jesus being at the heart of our worship. So I'm going to... Where am I pointing? There we go. So I'm going to start at verse 25 of, the, of um, Matthew 14. And let's read it together, shall we? Shortly before Jesus went out to them, so Jesus had set them out on the boat, if, if the first, first part say, and now he's going to walk out to them. Walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Now take courage. It is I. D don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Mm, come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Oh, you of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The bit I'm going to be looking at is that last little bit. And when he climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Have you ever heard the saying, finally the pennies dropped? It means you finally understand something after not understanding it for some time. The worst thing is when somebody thinks they've got a very good joke and they tell you it, and then you've got to explain it to them and explain it to them, and finally they get the joke. Or if it's something like me, a techie thing, somebody, I, you know, you just want to do something on your computer, so you get somebody around every time, or you're normally my son, and say, can you help us sort this out? And they do, and then you phone up again, can you help me sort this out? And eventually the penny drops that this is what, you know, you get it, you get it in here. Well, today I would like to suggest that for the disciples cowering in the boat, this was that type of moment. The penny finally dropped. Now, if we read earlier in Matthew, in, in, in chapter 8, we would read of another incident when a, um, a furious storm was sweeping waves over a boat that they were in, also on another lake, where it could have been the same lake, I don't know. Uh, and the disciples woke Jesus up, who was asleep at the bottom. And they were saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. And Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves and everything calms down. But this time, or back then, their response was different. Their response, if you read uh, chapter 8, verses 27, they, this is their response. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. I suggest that 
the disciples had not fully yet understood who they had in their presence. And I think sometimes I wonder, and I th- I'm guilty, I sometimes, I'm not, I, I really do not put Jesus in the right place. And I'm not totally aware of the awesomeness of who's in my presence. Or, you know, I'm in his presence, I should say. Jesus is always with us. We worship him today. Some beautiful songs lifting Jesus up. He's in our presence. But do we really take it on board? How awesome that presence is. And I'm thinking maybe the disciples this time saw something. Up to the point they have followed, witnessed, heard, observed all that Jesus has done. They had heard teachings they had never heard the likes of before. Spoken with authority. Witnessed all types of healings, even bringing a child back to life. You read this prior to this verse of 14. This is all happened in Matthew, that Matthew records. And before they got into the boat, we talk about how they fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. Now, we all have our own unique testimony of how we came to follow Jesus. And if you are here and you've you've not made that decision or are still looking, that's that's no problem because it's a journey. We all had to go on a journey. We all had to go on the journey of faith. That if you have always been like me before I came, you listened, you process, and you ask a lot of questions. You may have heard about Jesus by his Bible or by a friend, a Christian friend, comes alongside you and told you how God loved, accepted, and changed them. But in your journey, in all our journeys, we still have to wrestle with many things because it challenges us. Following Jesus challenges us, challenges our lifestyle, the way we live. The challenge is our time, what we do with it. Challenges our finances, how generous we can be with it in his glory, in his name. And it also challenges our hearts to accept people that maybe we wouldn't even look at or forgive people that we don't want to forgive. Following Jesus challenges us. Then we wrestle with the cynical side of ourselves. Like, you know, questions like, was Mary really a virgin? That can't happen, surely. Or, is Jesus really the Son of God or just a good man? We have to overcome those cynical questions inside us. So, following Jesus is not easy. The disciples, up to this point, if you think about it, may have seen Jesus as a great teacher. They may have seen him as some sort of medicine man with great healing powers, or an illusionist to feed 5,000. But to many in the world today, and then, he was still just a man. And there's something good about him, something special about him. Even other faiths would you know, recognize Jesus in the world, in their teachings but just as a man. But we could say, isn't there a lot of good people in the world, in past history and today? People like like Gandhi, he seemed to have this lovely aura about him. Mother Teresa did lots of great things. I could even look at you out here now and say, you're good people, haven't you done good things? Haven't you continuously sacrificed yourself, given away things, gone above and beyond? I could say that. I could, but I don't. Because I have to ask you about your CV. Has anyone healed without medicine a variety of ailments? Or raised people from the dead? Or make a fig tree wither by just cursing it? Or calm the storm? by commanding it, or walked on water. Jesus is set apart from everything else that we can think about. 
In our passage, Jesus had just defied the laws of creation by not only walking on water himself, but enabling Peter to do the same. When Peter fails, Jesus doesn't, because he never does. He saves Peter, walks him back across the water to the boat, and calms the storm. You see, we are safe in Jesus. He's the only hands that we are safe in. In the beginning, if you think about it, when they saw him coming, in the beginning, they were terrified, full of fear, not knowing what they were witnessing. But Jesus, being Jesus, calms them with words of encouragement. Don't be afraid. And in our lives, when the storms hit us, Jesus, just listen for his voice. You say, don't be afraid. I am here with you. I am here. So their fear turns to worship. And that means they were bowing down. Their heads down wherever they knelt. I don't know what room there was in this boat. Maybe he could have even laid down. Because suddenly, the penny dropped. Suddenly they saw Jesus as something uniquely in his own right. Something that was not just man. Something that was greater than man. See, in that moment, up to that moment, you could say, there have been bodyguards. They followed Jesus because he did have something about him to follow. But they were almost like they're his bodyguards because the crowds were coming around him and they were trying to keep him from sort of tramping over Jesus. They were not running around at this time distributing food in the baskets. They were not sitting down and listening to his teachings, although they just loved that. No, they were now confronted. They were in awe of what they had just witnessed. And maybe with all other things that had gone before, they were remembering, in my words, as I said, the penny finally drops, and they declare one big thing. Truly, you are the Son of God. Worship is the only response when we recognize Jesus, who Jesus really is. And as we bow down, Jesus is elevated and lifted high. This is not a casual act, though. And I think sometimes we forget that. It, you know, it, there's, there's joy in our hearts. Jesus is our friend, but he's also our King and our Savior and our Lord. And it's not a casual act when we come to worship. Knowing who Jesus really is should really actually make us tremble with reverent fear because of the awesomeness, the, the, the power within him. We worship two things I'm going to bring about, bring about worship. One is worship Jesus the creator. Jesus spoke the universe into being. He spoke us into being. As we read in Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God spoke and it came into being. Whenever God said, let there be, he was speaking, speaking everything into being. As some of you know, I used to get up at um, some ridiculous hour of about quarter past three every morning to milk cows. And I can assure you that although I was not grateful sometimes to be up at that time, it was a work I had to do. And one of the jobs most of the time is I had to, with a torch, go out into the fields and get the cows in by torchlight, just to get them in for milking. And I have seen so many wonderful dawnings of days. Colors that just you can't pick up, from oranges to purples, the sun rays coming up over the, 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 you know, the, sort of the, the horizon as the sun comes through and the beams through, and also in the middle of the night, basically the stars. There's certain times of the, I, you may know, but there's certain times of the year where you get a shooting star display. And you're in the middle of this, oh, you're, you're not, I'm like on my own with just the cows. 
out in the middle. And there's no sort of um, light pollution from anybody else. And they, you, you're just seeing. And you think, wow. Wow. God, praise your name. And sometimes, I don't know if you've ever seen stars before, you look at a line of stars and you see just start like they're all big and you see one sky. But then as you look again, you see little dimples behind and even more and more stars. It is so beautiful. So from the sunsets I've seen and the sunrises I've seen, I know what it is to, uh, to appreciate God. If, I, if you have to say to me, Skip, what made you come or understand uh, believe in God? That is it, creation. I cannot go down that evolutional crap track. Sorry about that. That's, I can't. This is created. This is design. This is not just, oh, work it out. No, this is design. Creation. Um, and then, after that, I had to then wrestle about, if God, if this is God, I want to know this God. Then if that is God, and God tells me that Jesus is the only way to him, then I believe that's my connection with Jesus. And I just sort of love this, the journey I've been on. So let's read. Okay. Too much. Oh. Yeah. Colossians 1.15 says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, wherever the thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things has been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Wow. There's no dispute in what God says about it. So let's have a look. The earth, created by God. What a wonderful place we live in. I don't know if you agree. Forget about the everything else. Just go back to the purity of creation itself. The world itself. There's, we are so blessed. We have so many things on, on this world. I don't know if you've been... I'm sure some of you have been on holidays to different parts of the country or the world, and you get different perspectives, mountains, valleys. We've got color. We've got diversity of plant life. We've got incredible sort of um, wildlife in the sea, out of the sea, all spoken into being. All spoken. Our world is big. It is big, and it's beautiful. And God spoke it into being. That's our son. Did you know it would take more than 330,000 earths to match the mass of the sun? And, or 1.3 million earths to fill the volume. That makes earth a little bit smaller doesn't it, compared to the sun. How did the sun get into the sky? God spoke it into the sun. And we think the sun is big. You are scutty, if that's how you say it. <laughs> I have no idea. You know, that is the biggest sun that they've recorded so far. And that is 1,700 times larger than the radius of our sun and is five billion and five billion suns could fit inside the sphere and size of the UY Scutty. That makes our sun small. What does that make our Earth? It's almost like a little... Why? Yeah. What about this one then? This is called the Milky Way. 
In the Milky Way, there are billions of stars and suns and planets in it. And our Milky Way, if you traveled at the speed of light, it is 186,000 miles per second. It would take you, how long do you think you'd get across our Milky Way? Go. No. Higher. Lower, I think. It would take 200,000 years to travel the length. So, this is only one of the galaxies. And who spoke it all into being? God. This makes Earth like a little speck. Because we're, I don't know where we are, we're somewhere, I think we're somewhere up here somewhere. A little speck. Um, yeah. We are so small in the universe of God, but so special in his sight, aren't we? So, take time and look up and be amazed at how big our God is. And if he can do that, he can do anything. All right? And that's not me at the morning. You know, I'm going to get my cows in. So, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities and eternal powers and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So, as you say, when people say, I don't know God or I cannot believe in God, they're missing what is obviously straight in front of them from our planet to everything around them. So no matter, but no matter how fascinating these images and calculations may be, my aim is not to show you how big our universe is, but to remind us again, or to let the penny drop maybe for the first time, how gigantically awesome, how majestically powerful, how indescribably big our God is. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. If that does not stir you, I don't know what's going to stir you. Creation is part of what we call the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. But there's more. There's more. There's more. Look at this. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. He's continuing every day, sustaining it, keeping it in place. He never sleeps, but continues to maintain all he has created. If God stopped speaking, I believe the universe would collapse. There would be no more. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls forth each of them by name because of his great power and mighty strength. Not one of them is missing. He knows everything. And not only does he know every star, he knows all of us. So he knows the massive things, but he very much knows every hair on our head. He knows all those little microorganisms that are on our planet, all the little cells that flow around our bodies, all the bones that we have in us. There is nothing that our God does not know. I just blown away. If you sit down and just think about it, it just blows you. It's almost too, too, too much to br to take in. But I want you to just take this. I want you to lift this up. I want you to rejoice in this message. This is a rejoicing message. Also, we worship Jesus as our Savior. Who be in the very nature of God 
being the first, sorry, who be, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exhorted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We worship Jesus because he came down from his heavenly throne where he had complete unity with Father and the Spirit. The one God, he came down and gave himself that we might have eternal life. He took the punishment and the shame, walked to the cross in obedience, looked at us, loved us, and still went through with it. I give my life for you. We are here today not worshipping an idol. We're not here today worshipping some, some distant God. We're here today worshipping a God of creation and a God that is our saviour and a God that's give us hope in our hearts even when we're going through the most tough times. Only he is worthy to be praised. So, just to bring it together now, we are called to worship Jesus in every area of our lives. That means, basically, I'm a father. I'm a husband. And I, got a I used to have a job. As a husband, I would treat my wife well. I would love her unconditionally that I can in my own human failness. I would try to teach my children in the ways of the Lord, or at least try to be a good father and not be harsh on them. At work, I would work as if I worked for the Lord. Therefore, even though I didn't, some of the jobs were hard or I didn't agree with, it wasn't for me to dispute that. My job was to serve the Lord and honor my employer. Whatever you look at, all your life, but it must come under Christ. It must come under the headship of Jesus. Worship means we put him up above us. Our families come below him. If we love our families under the guidance of Jesus, we'll have a better family life. If we use the job and all that, we, we, instead of going for um, our own sort of ambition, we lay it under God first. Then what, how we use our authority and how we use our money, it comes into perspective under the worship of Jesus. And that's what we got to look at. So worship affects every part of our lives. So everything we do, we should be able to say worship God through it. Worship puts Jesus on the undisputed throne of my life. Worship humbles us to the truth of who Jesus is, what he's done for us at a personal cost to himself, which are beyond words. Worship is now how we express our love to God and how much we depend and value him. Worship helps to change our mind. Set instead of fixation on ourselves or our problems, we fix our eyes on God who is greater than every situation. Worship will renew hearts. Knowing his love for me really overwhelms me, actually, when I really think about what he's done for me. Worship has and continues to change me. If worship doesn't change you in the light of that 
passage there and the pictures before about creation, if it doesn't change you, then I don't know what will. The disciples had come to a point of declaring that Jesus was no mere man, but the Son of God. Worship is not just singing. Far from it. It's about a penny-dropping moment that should and will change every part of our lives. To serve only Him. Because only He is worthy of our worship. And His name is Jesus. Can you come up? I've only got one application on this. All I ask is that you go home throughout this week and think of the wonders of God's creation. And I want you to think of what Jesus has done for you. Declare again that Jesus is the Son of of God, Savior of the world. And when you think of those two things together, the awesomeness of him, the energy, the power that caused to create in reverent fear, in reverent fear, I want you to quietly, in your quiet time of waiting, just worship him. Just worship him. Thank him and worship him. We're going to just finish on one song. Let's just rip it out there, shall we?